Global tensions are on the rise, and the next battleground might be fought over in outer space. No, we're not talking about a Star Wars kind of deal with shooting lasers and explosions. A modern day conflict in space would be more of a Cold War sort of deal, with a lot of posturing and espionage between nations. The space race of the 20th century was a contest between the United States and the Soviets, but for the interstellar conflict of the 21st century, the primary competition for the West has shifted to China. Plus, we've also thrown in some independent billionaire players like Elon Musk for a little added chaos this time around. And tensions are already on the rise, with China making significant plays into orbital space with their Tiangong station and the beginning of China's presence on the moon with their Chang'e rover. So, let's talk about how international conflicts are boiling over into space and even the moon. What does that look like and how is it going to play out? This is the space race. The biggest tell so far has actually come from NASA's senior administrator, Bill Nelson. He got a little bit rattled in an interview with a German newspaper called Bild, and Nelson said some pretty inflammatory things about China's ambitions in space. Nelson said, quote, China's space program is a military space program. Nelson also said, we must be very concerned that China is landing on the moon and saying, it's ours now and stay out. He pointed out that the south pole of the moon is already being hotly contested due to its potential water deposits. And then Nelson's boldest accusation came against the Tiangong station, as Nelson claimed the Chinese space station is being used to learn, quote, how to destroy other people's satellites. Now, obviously, that's unfounded. There is no provable reason to believe that China is weaponizing their space station or that they intend to annex the moon as a new territory of the People's Republic. But that didn't stop the most senior person at NASA from saying it, which obviously sparked a bit of anger in Beijing. And maybe that was Nelson's goal, to poke the bear and see how they react. I don't know. A spokesperson at the Chinese Foreign Ministry responded to Nelson's comments, stating, This is not the first time that the head of the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration has ignored the facts and spoken irresponsibly about China. The U.S. side has constantly constructed a smear campaign against China's normal and reasonable outer space endeavors, and China firmly opposes such irresponsible remarks, end quote. Now, what they mean by not the first time would be when Nelson accused China of stealing NASA rocket technology in May of this year. During a committee meeting, Nelson was asked about the potential threat from China, and he said, I think we are in a space race with China. They've done some impressive stuff. Rover on Mars, space station. Yes, they are good at stealing. We need to take cybersecurity very seriously in the government and private sector, end quote. The obvious implication there is that China is just copying NASA's work, which I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at. All rockets and rovers mostly look the same, and NASA hasn't even had an original design since the space shuttle anyway, aside from SLS, which is basically just space shuttle parts in a different shape, and it hasn't even flown yet. If anything, the Long March 5 might be a copy of ESA's Arian 5, they are very similar, but even those two rockets have significant differences. Anyway, let's talk about the moon for a second here, because Nelson made an interesting point about China taking ownership of the moon. And that's an interesting claim to make. Mostly because the United States have made the biggest moves by far to stake their claim on the moon, with multiple crewed landings in the 60s and 70s, plus a new plan to return there in this decade and establish a permanent U.S. presence on the moon. In advance of their return to the moon, the United States went ahead and wrote the new rules of the moon. These are the Artemis Accords, 
And this 21st century space treaty basically outlines everything that nations can and can't do in space, according to NASA. It's basically a refresh of the old Outer Space Treaty that was written up in 1969. So far, there are 20 nations who have signed the Artemis Accords. China is not one of them. No surprise. And also not surprising that the Chinese have negative opinions on the idea of NASA writing the space rules. Chinese commentators have been quick to frame this as the new era of Western colonialism. A popular Chinese media pundit, Song Zhangping, said, The US is developing a new space version of an enclosure movement in pursuit of colonization and claiming sovereignty over the moon. The enclosure movement is a deep cut into the history of English land ownership from the 18 and 1900s. Basically, the wealthy elites of early Britain would take a piece of land that was used by the common folk, but generally considered to be owned by no one. Just common land. And the rich folks would just build a big fence around it, or enclose it, and say, this is ours now, stay off. Not that China has much of a leg to stand on as they slowly assimilate formerly autonomous regions into their modern-day One China plan. Tibet and Xinjiang are pretty glaring examples of regions that were definitely not Chinese at the beginning of the 20th century, but have been forcibly inducted into the People's Republic, whether they like it or not. By the way, they don't. We've seen that more recently in Hong Kong, with the crackdown on anything that goes against China's official position, and we're likely about to see what happens when China extends that reach to the independent island of Taiwan. I've probably just been put on a Chinese blacklist for even saying that, but this is how Cold Wars operate. Each side calls the other a bad guy while simultaneously doing the exact thing that they are claiming to be bad. And that cycle just continues to escalate through increasingly bolder attempts at intimidation. Things weren't always this way, though. China did sign the original Outer Space Treaty of 1967, along with basically the rest of the world. Nations that don't even have a space program are signed onto this thing. There are two very important points in that document. Number one, quote, Outer space is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. And number two, states shall not place nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies or station them in outer space in any other manner. So that's all good news. But in the meantime, there have been some creative workarounds to think up space weapons that would not explicitly violate the treaty. The United States Air Force that they nicknamed Rods from God or Project Thor. The idea is basically just what it sounds like. They would drop metal rods from space onto specific targets. This is what would be referred to as a kinetic weapon, and these are the most effective space-based weapons. They utilize the incredible speed at which objects move while in orbit around the Earth. So the Air Force has the idea of dropping a telephone pole-sized metal rod from an orbital platform, which would hit the surface with the force of a ballistic missile traveling at about 10 times the speed of sound. It would only take 15 minutes to drop from orbit to the target, and the results would be devastating. As far as we know, the United States has not actually put any such thing into orbit, as far as we know. But this kind of shows us what weaponizing space would actually look like. It's not going to be laser cannons and photon torpedoes. Everything that is currently operating in space is both incredibly fragile in construction and moving incredibly fast. So all you need to do is hit a satellite or a space station with something solid to destroy it. So. When Bill Nelson is saying that he's worried about the Chinese weaponizing their space station, he knows that they're not going to do something obvious like strap a missile launcher to it. Because he also knows that they don't need to do that. All that a spaceship really needs is a slingshot and some heavy metal projectiles to become a highly destructive force in space. 
This would be incredibly stealthy and nearly impossible to track, because all you need to do is place a metal ball on a collision course orbit with the thing you want to destroy, and then just wait until the two of them meet up. But that's what the US Space Force is for, right? The world's one and only independent military branch dedicated to space. Donald Trump is one highly paranoid dude, and there is just something about the term Space Force that makes it sound like a joke, but in hindsight, this was probably one of the Big D's smarter decisions. The United States Space Force Act codified the Space Force as organized, trained, and equipped to provide freedom of operation for the United States in, from, and to space, and provide prompt and sustained space operations, with its stated duties described as to protect the interests of the United States in space, deter aggression in, from, and to space, and conduct space operations. The long-form explanation of what Space Force does is described in a text called Space Power Doctrine for Space Forces. No, I'm not kidding, that's the real name, and there is some very heavy language in this thing. Space Power establishes the Space Force's five core competencies. Space Security, Combat Power Projection, Space Mobility and Logistics, Information Mobility, and Space Domain Awareness. Space Power also lists the seven Space Power disciplines required for the core competencies as Orbital Warfare, Space Electromagnetic Warfare, Space Battle Management, Space Access and Sustainment, Military Intelligence, Cyber Operations, and Engineering and Acquisitions. So again, it's kind of fresh for NASA Administrator Nelson to be finger-wagging at China over a perceived threat when his own country literally wrote a doctrine preparing their military for space battles and orbital warfare. Anyway, this is the kind of stuff that we want to keep an eye on as the next generation of space exploration unfolds in the years to come. The 2020s, and especially the 2030s, are shaping up to be an unprecedented time for human interstellar travel. We will establish a human presence on the moon and we are going to try and do the same on Mars. To think that this will all go peacefully and smoothly would be a nice dream, but almost certainly is not going to be the reality of the situation. It's human nature to compete over land. It has defined our civilization since the dawn of recorded history. We all want the best spot, and we don't want anyone else to have it. And we literally will kill them for it unfortunately, as true now as it ever was. The only solace we can take is that the moon and outer space is very large. There is plenty to go around. And access to that space is very limited to basically just China, Russia, and the United States. And I guess Elon Musk. Somehow he's become the best case scenario in all of this. Elon is the only party involved that doesn't have a storied history and modern track record of ruthless, violent nationalism. And now we get to watch that play out in space and on the moon. Anyway, let us know what you think is going to happen as the 21st century space race unfolds. Is it all talk and no action? Or do we potentially have a real space war on our hands? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.